Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Please take your seats. And please welcome to the stage, Lori Stewart. Now, if you would join me in putting your attention to the screens, we're going to watch a short video. Created by the Arthritis Foundation, the Live Yes Arthritis Network makes possible meaningful connections that empower people to live their best life, both online and in person. This is where you can learn from experts and those who have similar experiences to yours. And you can give back, sharing your advice and learnings to benefit the whole arthritis community. You can also contribute to arthritis research through surveys and clinical trials, putting your mark on advancing treatments and a cure. Through Live Yes, people with arthritis find strength in each other, manage stress, and take control of their health care. Working together, we're transforming how people can live life with less pain and be more active. Together, we're improving physical health and emotional and social health and making sure no one feels left out. Through our collective power, we're doing amazing things. Colleen Ryan is just one example of what we can achieve. She turned to the Arthritis Foundation after her daughter Caitlin was diagnosed with arthritis at age three. Over time, it's really grown to be more of a therapy, I think, for our whole family because it's now about meeting new people and making connections that help us feel less alone. The best thing you can do is to educate yourself and to learn how to be an advocate. And no matter what you feel like your skill set is, advocacy, telling your story, fundraising, just even talking to other people, there's a way that you can be involved that's gonna be meaningful for you and your family. There's no real hard, fast rule book. Colleen connected with Adam Vigil, whose daughter Sage also had JA. Adam got involved and has immersed himself in helping others too. Besides benefiting yourself, Live Yes lets you support others. It's really hard to see your child in pain in it, and that's why we're so motivated about the Arthritis Foundation because they are working hard to find better therapies, to find that elusive cure so that we won't have to see our kids in pain. Live Yes participants like Colleen and Adam are just the tip of the iceberg. Multiply them by thousands, even millions more, maybe even you. And there are endless opportunities ahead to conquer arthritis through the Live Yes Arthritis Network. It's going to spread hope and make the burden lighter for you as you go through your journey. Sign up and browse our online community forums. Contribute to a conversation or start a new topic. Take surveys that help advance research. Make new friends. Join us in this life-changing opportunity. Together we will grow our community and conquer arthritis. Live yes. Live your best life. Join us now. Very compelling, the faces of arthritis, right? Okay, so now we're gonna have a session with a panel of experts regarding some important issues affecting people with arthritis. At this time, I would like to welcome to the stage, Cindy McDaniel. Cindy's a Senior Vice President of Consumer Health and the Impact at the Arthritis Foundation. Cindy, join us and your panel. Hello, life-changing. Those are two words we've heard a lot today. I think those words kind of are becoming the epitome, the, the rallying cry of the Live Yes Arthritis Network. And I hope that at this point in this day, you're starting to feel a little bit of that yourself. Because you guys are experiencing the network, if you think about it. You know, this morning, some of us, some of you, <laughs> got up and did early morning yoga with the group. Most of us spent the morning in small groups working with people like us on, on subjects of common interest in committees or trainings, things like that. At lunch, we laughed together, may have cried a little bit during Rob's hospital story, and had an opportunity to really learn. We just had a chance to see behind the scenes at some of the new uh, entities and components of the Live Yes Arthritis Network. Throughout the day, chances are you've made connections. Chances are you've connected with people that you maybe didn't know before. If you've been here before, chances are you renewed connections, you reconnected with people that you know from the past. I hope through some of it you have certainly learned and feel like you're part of something bigger. 
That really is the power of the network. That's the power of the network that we can experience while we're here. So you're here as a leader. We're all here as leaders and champions in the new network, but we're also participants. And this session is for you. This session is kind of a treat. You're probably going to say it better be at 4.30 on a rainy, dreary, dull day. And we're very well aware that we're between you and some rest and then cocktails and, and our um, wonderful evening of honors. So what we're going to do here, this is not a training. It's not a how-to, to-do, et cetera. But it's really an opportunity for you to sit back, relax, and listen. We've got some great subject matter experts on subjects that we believe are going to be of interest to you. They're certainly the things that resonate with people when we ask, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In keeping with the personal nature of the network, we're structuring this as something of a fireside chat, a little less formal. I'll be up here, and I'll ask questions and that kind of thing. And because the network always points people on a path to other resources to help them. We'll also have someone here that can provide the AF perspective and give us some information on further resources. So I'm going to ask my panelists to join me here. First of all, we have Dr. Lona Sandin. Um, you can see on the screen, Lona has a lot of initials after her name. There's a lot of ands. There's a lot of ands in her bio here. She's the program director, associate professor, and a distinguished teaching professor in the Department of, of Clinical Nutrition at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. She clearly has a strong professional interest in how nutrition impacts chronic disease. She also has a personal interest that she shared with me. She's lived with rheumatoid arthritis for 25 years, and her mother lived with lupus complications for 50 years. So it's clearly a personal calling for her. Dr. Sandin, um, also in addition to her focus on nutrition, has a strong, she's a strong advocate of staying physically active every day. So those of you who feel energetic in the morning, she's going to be leading yoga for us in the morning at 7. Also, I'll just mention it's worth noting that she's here by popular demand. Um, she did a session on nutrition at the Arthritis United Conference earlier this year, and it was a runaway success. I thought we were never going to pry people away from her after it, so um, I think you'll enjoy her a lot. Okay, second, I'd like to welcome Colette Koulianis. Colette is Senior Director of Payer Relations at the Hemophilia Foundation. And you know, people with hemophilia similar to those with arthritis deal with a lot of the same issues, access challenges, barriers to care, affordability issues, certainly payer issues. Colette is a real expert on the payer side of the issue. She spends a lot of her time working with payers in the marketplace issues. She really knows the ins and outs of how this works. She helps navigate patients through the health coverage issues and stays up to date on emerging issues in insurance. She does speak regularly to a wide cross-section of patients and providers and others. And she shared with me today that she's been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. So she definitely also has a personal connection to chronic pain and the issues that we talk about all the time. And last but certainly not least, um, please welcome our own Nick Turkus. Nick is Director of Help and Support at the Arthritis Foundation. He's been on staff for nearly 20 years in a number of rows. Ro roles, she said, first at the market level, then regionally, and now at the home office. Um, Nick focuses on our key help and support resources, overseeing things like the Helpline Walk With These, Arthritis Resource Finder, and, and our signature RA education event. Nick also shared, and this was not planned, that his work is all the more personal this year. His father just received his second knee replacement, and Nick's wife, Jessica, will have surgery on her foot coming up soon due to osteoarthritis. I think most of us in this room have a personal connection. That's why we're here. That makes the cause that much more powerful. So we have three speakers who really get it. Okay, before we start the panel, I just want to take a couple of minutes and take a quick step back and um, talk a little bit about the why. We talked about why in our session earlier today, and I'm gonna circle back to the why again, just real quickly, of the Live Yes Arthritis Network. We know that we're here to connect people, connecting people to other people like them and to life-changing, there's that word, resources and, um, and individuals that can help. Certainly empowering, empowering people to be active in their own healthcare journey, as well as empowering them to be confident when they're dealing with healthcare providers and that kind of thing. And then driving impact through the three domains we talked about this morning, physical health, mental and emotional health, and experience of care. It's a big goal to really impact people on those kind of issues in their life. 
And if we're going to do it, and we are going to do it, we're going to have to be um, very, um, in, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for is intentional. That's why I have notes. Intentional and strategic in our approach to it. So the key, we believe, is really focusing on the topics and issues that people care about. And as you know, we do a lot of consumer listening in the course of any year. We do surveys and focus groups and all kinds of things. And throughout that work, we've had a number of themes that come up very, very consistently over and over and over. You may have heard me talk about these in the past. You've probably heard us talk about the importance of pain, obviously physical pain, but also the emotional pain, isolation, depression, frustration, fear that often comes with living with arthritis, mobility challenges, things like that. Certainly better outcomes. People want a cure, but short of that, they want fewer days with active disease. They want to be able to live the life they want, to go and do the things they really enjoy doing. Clearly access to care. You know, we have life-changing medications now, really, really life-changing medications for, for RA and psoriatic arthritis and so many conditions. But it is heartbreaking when people can't access those because of access issues. So we'll hear about that in a minute. Certainly better daily living is of real interest to people. They want to be able to get up and go. They want to be healthy and live a wellness lifestyle. And connections, just the simple importance of connecting with other people like themselves. So we've focused in here on a couple of topics in that spectrum. Certainly we chose nutrition because, to be honest, it's the most searched and visited content on our website. We know people are looking, always looking for that. Um, insurance issues, ability to pay for the drugs and get the coverage you need is one of the key questions we get on our helpline. So we're going to focus on those topics. I will tell you today's presentations are necessarily brief. You may have questions that we don't get to during the, during the presentation. So there are cards on your table. I would encourage you, if you have questions along the way, write them down, and you can just hold up your card at any point. There's people around the room who will be looking for you to hold up your card, and they're going to collect them so that when we finish this panel portion, we can quickly move into a very brief Q&A. So I know our time's short here. I'm going to move on, and we will begin the panel discussion. So I'm going to start with Dr. Sandin. We're going to do nutrition first. So just give us a general overview. How does eating well contribute to living well with arthritis? As you would expect, eating well is very important to living with arthritis. There are three key things that I want to talk about in the importance of eating well, and that is immune system function, controlling inflammation, and maintaining functional status by maintaining lean muscle mass. So let's start with immune function. In order to have a healthy functioning immune system, you need to start with nutrition. The basis behind our immune system is amino acids or proteins. You may remember from high school biology learning that amino acids were the protein building blocks. Well, those amino acids are also the building blocks for things like antibodies that help fight off disease and infection, so bacteria and viruses. When we build antibodies to fight off bacteria or viruses that invade our body, those antibodies come from the protein that we eat every day. And we have to nourish our body with protein every day. We don't store extra protein in our body, so it's important to get good quality protein sources on a daily basis. Also, to build our immune system, it's important to include things like vitamins and minerals. So vitamins like A and C, minerals like zinc and selenium, again, are essential for maintaining a healthy, functioning immune system. Without those, we cannot function at our best or our optimum. Let's talk a little bit about inflammation. We know that food can influence inflammation in the body. Most of you know, because you have that diagnosis of some form of arthritis, that food affects you differently, and you may feel as if you maybe have more tenderness or soreness after eating certain types of foods. So food can affect that inflammation, the systemic inflammation that's going throughout our bodies. When you have systemic inflammation, it can be damaging not just to your joints and your bones, but it can also be damaging to your vascular system, all your veins and arteries. 
And what food can do or what food can provide and nutrition can provide, again, is those vitamins and minerals, particularly the antioxidant vitamins and minerals, A, C, and E, those things found in fruits and vegetables and healthy fats can help protect our bones, our joints, and other tissues from damage that's being caused by inflammation markers in the body. So it's important that we get enough of those. And people with chronic disease, whether it be arthritis or other forms of chronic disease, autoimmune conditions, need more of this in their day-to-day -day life than someone without those conditions. The research in nutrition demonstrates that those of us with systemic inflammation use up our vitamin A and C more rapidly than someone without systemic inflammation. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of maintaining functional status through maintaining lean muscle mass. As a result of systemic inflammation, it actually becomes more difficult for you to maintain and rebuild lean muscle tissue. And so inflammation can actually deteriorate that lean muscle tissue. Some of the medications you might take for treating arthritis, particularly prednisone or other corticosteroids, can actually further exacerbate that decline in lean muscle tissue. So again, looking at quality protein sources, lean proteins can help maintain our muscle mass and help prevent some of that loss that is typically associated with that, uh, the chronic disease. Now, along with that, you kind of need to do some physical activity, too. The protein can't work alone. But that, in a nutshell, are three main reasons why we need to make sure we have good nutrition. Thank you. You know, we hear so much about the gut microbiome these days as a component in good nutrition and good health much more broadly. What can you tell us about how the gut micro microbiome is connected to inflammatory arthritis and some of the things you were just talking about? Well, what we know about the microbiome is still very much in its infancy. There's a lot of hype that you will find out there on the internet or even in the media that may simply not be true or at least not well researched. However, there are a few things that we do know. We do know that about 20% of individuals who have inflammatory bowel diseases, so think ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, that sort of thing, also have some form of arthritis. So there's a gut connection there. We also know from other research that has been done that people with arthritis have been found to have an imbalance of the healthy type of bacteria compared to the less healthy bacteria. So our less healthy bacteria is overcoming the healthy bacteria. And what happens or what can happen with that is there can be more inflammation produced in the gut. When you have inflammation produced in the gut, it opens up the cell walls in the gut or allows what, what they call tight junctions in the gut to be looser. And when this is loose, it can allow things that would normally get passed out of the body to actually go across the gut membrane and end up in the bloodstream and in the body where it really does not belong. This is one of the triggers that is hypothesized that may cause some forms of arthritis. So we all have E. coli and salmonella and things like that in our gut, but generally we keep it in check with our healthy bacteria. However, there has been research studies that have shown that in some individuals with rheumatoid arthritis in particular have been found to have salmonella, <laughs> E. coli, and listeria and other types of bacteria actually in their joint spaces. Wow. You should not have these things in your joint spaces. <laughs> <laughs> But it is believed that some of these bacteria or viruses that get across can then change a genetic expression that might lead to an autoimmune condition or trigger some kind of inflammatory response that then just doesn't shut off. And so we do want to make sure we have a healthy gut to help prevent some of this from happening. 
Um, again, you know, the research is still very much in its infancy, but there's enough there to say there's something going on and there's something that we should probably be paying attention to. Well, it sounds like it's really important to keep our gut microbiome healthy, so let's get practical. What can we do through nutrition? What should we be eating and, and doing to keep it healthy? One word, fiber. <laughs> if you did nothing else, add more fiber. So what does that mean? How do we add more fiber? So where do we find fiber in our foods? Fruits and vegetables. So we need to be eating more fruits and vegetables. So people with arthritis are not immune to eating poor diets. <laughs> <laughs> there was a study done that looked at some, some data that was collected through NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And what they showed was that people with arthritis score only 58.1 on something called the Healthy Eating Index. 100 points would be ideal, okay? So as a population of people with arthritis, we're generally doing pretty poor in our dietary habits. So increasing fruits, vegetables, and other sources of fiber like whole grains, so think oatmeal, brown rice, quinoa, wild rice, those sorts of things, adding more of those into your diets to increase your fiber intake and getting your fiber intake to about 25 to 30 grams per day will help build up those healthy bacteria in the gut. Another way to build healthy bacteria is through uh, fermented foods, so things like yogurt or kefir or sauerkraut or kimchi. I prefer yogurt <laughs> <laughs> or, or kefir. Kefir is tolerable. I'm not so sure about kimchi and I'm not a big sauerkraut fan personally. But there's several different fermented foods that you can consume. These are considered what we call probiotics. So they actually provide live healthy bacteria to the body. Those live healthy bacteria then go into the colon and they need something to feed on to stay alive. And what they feed on is those fibers that come from, from the fruits and vegetables that you've been eating. Well, so obviously we want to eat a good healthy diet of fruits and vegetables and, and those kind of things. What about supplements? We hear a lot of marketing for them. What do you think about supplements? So supplements should be exactly what they are, supplements. I like to take a food first approach and look at the underlying diet first. Where can we make improvements in just our day-to-day -day food choices and get the best out of our food first? And then use supplements as an add-on, particularly using supplements in more of a functional way, not to, to replace foods, but to use them in a functional way. So an example of that would be, say, vitamin D. It's likely 80% of us here in this room are deficient or maybe insufficient in vitamin D. We just don't get out in the sun enough to get the vitamin D conversion that our body would naturally do if we had adequate sunshine every day. We're stuck in offices. And to get enough vitamin D through food, you would have to eat quite a bit. So the recommendation for vitamin D is 600 IUs or 15 micrograms, depending on what label you're looking at. One glass of milk only provides about 100 IUs of vitamin D. So if you're going to get to 600 IUs of vitamin D, that would be six cups of milk. How many of you are actually drinking six cups of milk per day? <laughs> Okay, how many of you are eating about three pieces of salmon a day? No, how many of you are eating a bucket of almonds a day? <laughs> Some days. <laughs> Some days. Yeah. So it's very challenging to get adequate vitamin D through food alone, and that's where you can use a supplement more in a functional way to bring up those levels. Uh, if you don't have time to spend 15 minutes in the sun every day or you're sitting here in Baltimore and you've seen what it looks like outside. <laughs> you can also, uh, you know, so, so vitamin D is a prime example of that. Taking fish oil might be another example of that. Or even some of the other supplements that are out there like turmeric that people may be taking. To get enough turmeric to change inflammatory levels, you need more than what you might typically put on your, your rice and chicken. And so using a supplement more in a functional way rather than to replace food is a better way to go. Wow, well that's great advice.
Thank you very much. I'm going to bet people in this room have questions. So don't forget, you can write questions on your card, hold them up. We'll collect them, and we'll have some time afterward. Here's a question. We'll have some time afterward to come back. But let's move on right now. I'm going to change subjects pretty dramatically with Colette. <laughs> and, but um, another aspect of living well, certainly, as I said, is being able to access the medications. And I mentioned life-changing medications. Once a patient gets stable on a medication, the last thing they want to do is change because they might have actually gone through a lot of steps to get to that stable medication. Um, a lot of plans do require people to try and fail various medications to get there. So if someone changes insurance for whatever reason and the new insurance is going to require them to go back through that step therapy, go back through that, that trial and error with other drugs, I'm wondering what you would advise them to do? What is the what is the best approach? Is there an exemption request people can go through? What happens if they're denied? What should people do at that point, at that juncture? Well, so nothing affects the gut uh, microbiome like access to care issues. <laughs> so I imagine for people who deal with this all the time, I should probably have 12 cups of milk a day. But um, so step therapy, uh, also known as fail first, is one of sh uh, strategies that payers use to try to rein in the high cost of specialty drugs. It's all part of utilization management, UM is what it's referred to. And so it means that they're going to put a preferred drug list in place. They're going to be either generics on the preferred drug list or um, you didn't hear this here, they get a higher rebate on the back end, so that's how that got on the drug list. But whatever the reason, you have to first try what's the approved drug list. And various fail-first or step therapy plans uh, are, can be different, but the idea is that you would have to try at least one, and in some cases two or three different drugs, and fail on those, um, not have a response or have an adverse reaction, before and for a period of time. Um, so it can be a month or longer. Usually fail first period is usually three months before you can actually get to the drug you wanted. Um, but once you, um, uh, you know, hit that, then you, and gone through all the checks, then you could actually access the drug the doctor wanted you on in the first place. So the question is, what happens if it changes or they change their insurance plan? Right. Um, so we'll talk about if they change their insurance plan. Let's say they change jobs. Yeah. And that was a mid-year change is what you're talking about. Yeah. So there's, there's really one option that's given to them. That's the plan that is um, part of the new employer plan. Um, there are uh, definitely um, waivers, exemptions that physicians can file for on your behalf if you have uh, been on a drug that's worked for you, especially if you've gone through Fail First already and you've already met the criteria, then they can appeal the decision to get the drug on. There are states that are, some states already have legislation that are trying to protect patients from being switched, especially in a mid-year switch, um, and other states are, are looking into it. Um, and so, you know, part of what we do at the National Hemophilia Foundation, I know what you guys do and several other large national advocacy organizations is trying to get legislation to protect yeah. patients from this. But I would say start with having your physician help you uh, on an appeal and, um, and then, you know, go from there. And documentation is going to be key. So you want to be able to document why the other drug isn't the right drug or other drugs for you. So keeping your own health records that right. you can then make sure that the doctor's office has access to to work with you on that. Right. What about if it's your own current plan that makes a change? We hear sometimes that even in the middle of a plan year, they suddenly get a letter at home and it says we've made a change and we're not going to cover your drug anymore. What do we do then? Well, there are also uh, legislation being considered both on a federal level and state that protects patients, especially like on the marketplace exchange, right? You sign up for a plan, and unless you have a qualifying event, you can't change plans until the next um, open enrollment, right? You're stuck on that plan regardless. Well, then it, the same protection should be given to the patients, and that's kind of the um, argument that's being used. So if a plan decides to change mid-year or raise uh, price out of pocket, then those patients would get protections at least for the rest of that calendar year. Okay. Um, now, I said some states have the legislation already. Others don't. 
but again, it's, it's a, an appeal process you'll need to go through. And um, a lot of medications do have, um, if part of the um, uh, argument that you can get even the, uh, meta the manufacturer of the medication can help with some language as well if you reach out to those folks. So. Wow, you know, we often hear people tell us that managing the paperwork is sometimes more onerous than managing the disease, and I can certainly see that here. So let's talk a little bit about selecting a plan. It's open enrollment right now, mm -hmm. hearing a lot about that, and whether people are, you know, selecting a new plan through an employer or, or the exchanges. Um, People have a hard time comparing plans. There's a lot of complexity. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe one plan covers certain drugs, but the out-of-pocket costs are higher. Others have a lower cost profile, but the drugs you need aren't included. Do you have any tips to help people wade through that maze? And while we're talking about it, what is coinsurance, which is often mentioned in these plans? Right, so that's a good question. Um, there, it is a maze. But I would say, first of all, it's important to understand the payer mix in the country. So if you looked at all the uh, insurance across the country, about 50%, just slightly over, are uh, commercial plans. And, of, and then you have Medicare, Medicaid, and individual or marketplace plans. Of the commercial plans, 63% are self-funded employer plans. And why it's important to know that is because now 43% of those self-funded employer plans only offer high deductible health plans, right? So, um, so now I'm gonna get into what is the difference of these. So if you had your choice and you had a PPO, an EPO, a POS, and that's not what you think it means, <laughs> an HMO or a high deductible health plan, you have options. One thing to remember is the higher the, um, the premium, then the lower the out-of-pocket is gonna be for the year. So a lot of people will choose a plan because the premium's low, but that correlates to a higher out-of-pocket. Mm -hmm. The lowest premiums are gonna be affiliated with an HMO, which is a very restrictive network, and not usually something I would recommend if you have a chronic disease, unless you've researched it thoroughly, your physicians are in, your medications are in, your Cytocare is in, then fine. But, or it's a high deductible health plan. So those are gonna be the lowest premiums. And with those are gonna mean higher out-of-pocket costs of the year. It's also important to know that the premiums that people pay is like a membership. I liken it to a membership. If you join the gym, you pay a gym membership every month. You stop paying the gym membership, you no longer have your insurance. So your insurance uh, premium does not count towards your out-of-pocket, and a lot of people get that confused. So premium is like your gym membership, it's the cost of getting your plan. Most people have their employer pay some percentage of that um, through their workplace. So then, what out-of-pocket costs you do have, you have deductibles, you have co-pays and co-insurance. So if it's a high deductible health plan, which is gonna offer the cheapest premiums, you are gonna have a deductible, and they can range from 1,500 on up, and those deductibles can go all the way up to the max out of pocket, which this year is 7,350. And so if your deductible, let's say is $5,000, you must pay the entire deductible before the plan picks up a penny. So that's important for you to know. If that's gonna be a problem, or if you depend on co-pay assistance from the manufacturer to help with that deductible, there's another issue, which we'll get into here in a second that could affect that for you. Um, so you'll wanna look at that. If you cannot afford the deductible before the plan starts, that might not be the right plan for you, okay? You might pay a little more on your premium, but you're gonna have lower out-of-pocket costs. And so um, that's really the important thing to remember is don't always just look at the lowest premium because you're gonna get uh, more out-of-pocket and more yeah. restrictive networks usually with that. Um, when you choose a, um, uh, the plan, it, it's important now to understand you meet the deductible. So whatever plan it is, you have a deductible, you must pay the deductible before the plan starts to pay, before the benefits are active. Once you've met the deductible, then you have coinsurance, which is usually a shared percentage. So it might be 80-20 um, is the most common. So you've met your deductible, and now you're gonna pay 20% of the costs uh, of your health care, and the uh, plan is gonna pick up 80% until you meet your max out of pocket. 
So what constitutes your max out of pocket? Every plan is different, but the most it can be is $7,350 for an individual, $14,700 for a family. So, but a lot of them are much less than that. So again, you'll want to look at what's your deductible, what's your max out of pocket uh, for the plan year. Uh, once you have met your deductible and you're paying your coinsurance and your copays, so you get copays at the pharmacy counter depending on what tier your drug is in. You have a copay if you go see your doctor or specialist. You might have a copay at the emergency room. All those add up until you meet your max out of pocket. And that's referred to by the plan as your accumulator. So if you hear the term accumulator in healthcare, that is what the plan. Um, calls your added out-of-pocket costs that you've spent during the plan year, and it's a way for them to track until you hit your max out-of-pocket. And at that point, they're going to owe 100. You know, they're going to be paying 100 percent. So, well, on that subject, talk to us a little bit about copay cards. I know copay cards can be a lifesaver for people, but we're hearing how they're being challenged in some accumulator adjustment programs. So, can you talk just a little bit about that? Yes. So, accumulator adjusters. Um, are a big issue. Um, it, it took off in beginning of 2017. Uh, by now that they're suggesting it's upwards of 40, 45 percent of health plans have accumulator adjuster language in them. And um, accumulator adjusters simply mean, so remember, accumulator is your added up out-of-pocket costs. So up until these accumulator adjuster plans kicked in, you could use a copay card at the time of purchase. And that copay card helped you meet your max out of pocket. It counted to your deductible. It counted to, you know, as a copay. It counted to your max out of pocket. These accumulator adjusters now, the, the um, specialty pharmacy or PBM that's managing the pharmacy benefit, at the end of the month, just for ease of understanding this, the program would look at your costs that you paid, see if you yourself paid. And if it wasn't you, then they would reset your accumulator to reflect only what you've paid. So if you have a $5,000 deductible and you have a copay, or a, co or a copay card that has a value of $10,000, you use $5,000 in January because your drug costs more than $5,000, let's use as an example. And then at the end of the month, they reset the accumulator. So you don't even realize that right, if you don't understand this language. And then the next month, they use that copay card again. And now that copay card's max for the year. They've reset your accumulator. So come March, you go to pick up your medicine, and they say, how are you going to pay your $5,000 deductible? And so that's when patients are calling it the copay surprise. This is, and they call it you know, double dipping. Well, it can be way more than double dipping. The example I just used would be triple dipping, because they're going to use the copay card twice. So they're going to pay your deductible twice, and they're going to pay it again. So we formed a coalition, Anna Hyde, um, with your organization, myself, uh, Carl Schmidt from the AIDS Institute, and um, Nord. Uh, we joined together, and we are on the steering committee and formed a national coalition, and we're working to fight against the accumulator adjusters. So, Well, thank you. It's tough to get this far into a subject and stop. So it, <laughs> I would prefer not to if we had a lot more time. Don't forget, write down questions for Colette. Hold it up. Someone can go get it right now. Um, I do think it's important to note on this subject we've been talking about that the Arthritis Foundation is very active. Um, our advocacy team's here in front, and they are uh, part of our advocacy team. So we're very active, as Colette just mentioned, fighting for you guys, fighting for your colleagues, your, your um, constituents on these kinds of access issues, but it's challenging. It's a challenging landscape. Can I just, I want to raise one point. There are 18 states right now that have some protections against step therapy um, language, and so you can go to saimcoalition.org, uh, and you can look at a state map and click on the states that show they have some language, and so it's, it's some guarantee for the patients that if your physician attests that you need the medication or some other set criteria, as long as you meet one of them, then they cannot uh, deny your, um, your access to that medication. So um, go to that site and look, and you might live in one of the states that would protect yeah. you anyway. Well, it's good to know. And, and I, again, our time is, is so limited. I will mention that 
The Arthritis Foundation is also a leader on the same coalition, uh, co-chairing that. And we have state directors that most of you probably already know and work with who can really help you sort through and know what's available in your state. So if we were at a Live Yes event in a community, um, this might be about how long the presentations would be. They're, they're typically not terribly long, but Clearly, we're leading with a lot of questions, and people are going to want more information and more resources. So we've asked Nick to join us for the purpose of playing the role of a, probably a volunteer, a volunteer in a local market who's very familiar with the Arthritis Foundation's resources and, and um, information and can help people know where to go after the session to get more details and help. So, Nick. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be part of this team uh, with the Arthritis Foundation. All of the tools and resources that we share today do relate back to those hot topics that Cindy talked about earlier. So all of that intentional program we are bringing to the uh, Live Yes Arthritis Network. And for many of you that are hearing about the Live Yes Arthritis Network for the first time, just like you said, this is exactly what that event would look and feel like. Arthritis Foundation staff and volunteers and people uh, with arthritis coming together, learning about arthritis and learning about strategies to better manage your arthritis. And we're so excited to bring those people together, not only in communities all across the country, but online and bringing that content in a moderated way where they can find answers to their questions. For those 20 million people that we learned about, arthritis.org is the first place that they're probably going to go when they've been diagnosed with arthritis. And our website has so much great information. It has information about arthritis, the type of arthritis that you have and how it affects your body, living with arthritis, tools and resources to manage your disease, including our toolkits, uh, nutrition, diet, recipes. We've got information about breakthroughs in research. We have information about all of the 100 uh, wins that we've had in the advocacy team and how to get involved, uh, more involved as a volunteer and how to sign up for the next Jingle Bell Run. Uh, we talk, <laughs> Colette talked about access issues and you're probably overwhelmed. Uh, and if you are, uh, you our, uh, you should go to our uh, Prescription for Access Toolkit. And the Prescription for Access Toolkit has really important information for people that are uh, making decisions about their health care. We learned that right now is open enrollment for Medicare and for state exchanges. And this toolkit has information about understanding how insurance works, definitions to key words like coinsurance and accumulator. Uh, understanding coverage options and how to pick a plan. And once you have a plan, if you run into problems, how to make an appeal, uh, making appeals to all of the different plans that are out there, and then also paying for care. So um, uh, just having insurance is one thing, but being able to pay for it is another. And so our Rx for Access Toolkit is the best place to go for all of those questions. If you're really confused and you need to talk to an expert, the Arthritis Foundation has a team of licensed clinical social workers that can answer your personal questions about arthritis. We have thousands of people that have called our hotline or emailed our experts and asked them questions about how can I pay for this medicine? How can I see a, a doctor uh, when I'm a veteran and there's not a uh, VA clinic nearby. Uh, we have questions about um, getting care for children, school issues. The uh, helpline team are truly your ally and your experts, and those calls are answered seven days a week. Who subscribes to Arthritis Today? Who loves it? Yep. So it continues to be our flagship publication, and Arthritis Today has uh, wonderful stories about uh, breakthroughs in arthritis research. It has inspiring stories about people with arthritis. It has tips to manage your arthritis and complete your daily activities, wonderful diet and, and recipe information. And Arthritis Today is more than just a magazine. It's got, uh, well, you can sign up for e-newsletters uh, to receive um, uh, uh, topics uh, that are more interesting to you, and everybody loves our drug and supplement guide that has great answers to um, questions about those topics. Okay. So thank you, Nick. So I think we're now ready for questions. Do we have some questions from the audience, Vicki, that we can, we have 10 minutes or so, I think, that we can spend on questions. So 
Let's see what we have. Okay, this is for Dr. Sandin. Is a vegetarian diet safe for someone with arthritis? Yes, a vegetarian diet is safe for someone with arthritis. There is a difference between being vegan and vegetarian. I want to clarify that because sometimes there's some confusion. So vegans eat absolutely no animal products. I wouldn't necessarily recommend a complete vegan diet for someone with arthritis. When you go totally vegan, you come up short on vitamin D, calcium, B12, zinc, and iron, and several other nutrients, which are essential for people living with arthritis to have. So vitamin D and calcium, we know people with arthritis have poor bone health. You take out food sources of those nutrients and you further exacer exacerbate their bone health. B12 is only found in animal products. And so if you're vegetarian and you consume milk or cheese or yogurt, you're gonna get B12. But if you're vegan, you're not gonna get B12. And so you either need to take a supplement or eat some milk or cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Also, with a straight-up vegan diet and you're not including any animal products, it gets harder and harder to get adequate protein. So if you ever try to eat enough beans to get 60 grams <laughs> worth of protein from beans and legumes, you m just might explode. Yeah. <laughs> you will have adequate fiber. Uh -huh. <laughs> but your colon may be not so happy. When your colon's not happy, you're not happy. So... I, if someone wants to do vegetarian where they're still consuming something like milk, cheese, yogurt, and eggs, then there's ways to get more than adequate nutrition, adding those foods into the diet along with plenty of beans, fruits, and, and vegetables. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, the next question is for Colette. How do I find out if my insurance is using accumulator adjustments with my uh, with copay cards, with my plan? So the problem is that in general, um, we know because United Healthcare does a study uh, or a survey every year, about 9% or less of, of the American public even understand basic healthcare terms like premium, copay, coinsurance, and deductible. So it's even more challenging when they um, add accumulator adjuster language and they call them very clever names these PBMs do. Sorry if you're one in the room, mm -hmm. but <laughs> names such as uh, let's see, copay benefit maximization allowance program. <laughs> that sounds like they're giving you a gift. <laughs> and, and honestly, in fact, patients think that when they get the letter that says we've identified that you're on a specialty drug that has copay assistance available. Um, and you may still use that copay assistance to help with your high out of pocket costs. Period. Next paragraph. Because we've implemented a new copay benefit maximization allowance program, um, that any payments made um, by sources other than yourself do not count to your accumulator. So by then, you know, patients have zero idea. They're back at the, yes, I can still use the copay card uh, to help with my out-of-pocket costs. So what we recommend, especially as we're in open enrollment, is to do a search, because it could be on page like 87 in fine print, subsection B, um, is that you would do a, a search on the document, searching for copay, searching for accumulator, searching for uh, copay assistance, out of pocket, and um, generally one of those will bring up some language that will um, clue you in as to wow. whether or not. So it's definitely looking for that needle in the haystack in there somehow, yeah. Yeah, and, but we did, um, again, our, our group, um, which included Anna, myself, and Carl, we met with CMS and CCIO, and we talked about um, the importance of making uh, some sort of legislation that forces these health plans to be clear so that patients don't fall into this trap of not understanding. So. Well, thank you all for the work you're doing on that. All right, Nick, I have a quick one for you. Sure. Are there physical activity resources available in the Live Yes Network? 
Absolutely. Uh, the uh, Arthritis Foundation continues to provide information about group fitness programs. You can find that on our website and through our Arthritis Resource Finder. You can find group fitness programs, including our legacy Arthritis Foundation aquatics and exercise programs. And I would also encourage you to check out Walk with Ease. Walk with Ease is a group or uh, self-directed six-week walking program where you gradually start with just 10 minutes of walking. And by the end of the six weeks, you'll be walking for nearly an hour hour, and there is lots of evidence to prove that it will reduce your pain and increase, uh, increase your balance and a uh, function. Excellent. Okay, Dr. Sandin, another one for you. Does gender play a role in the imbalance of good and bad microbes in the gut microbiome? So gender really has more benefits probably in terms of blocking inflammatory pathways more so than working in the gut. So there's components, these polyphenol plant compounds that are found in ginger that actually work similar to NSAIDs, so things like ibuprofen. And they can work in the production of something we call cytokines, so they're chemical messengers that promote inflammation. And they can work in these pathways that increase the production of cytokines to actually shut down some of that cytokine production and decrease inflammation. Turmeric works in a similar way as well, and so do other polyphenols that are found in things like onions and garlic and, and apples. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, Colette, I have time for one more for you. Do any states currently have step therapy portability or a, certi or a certificate, so that, certificate so that a patient only has to fail first one time? Well, I know that I can't 100% guarantee that answer. I can tell you that there are 18 states that have protections where they wouldn't even necessarily have to fail. For example, if you switched your insurance or if the plan switched mid-year and it's no your drug is no longer on the preferred drug list, and your physician attests, as I mentioned, that's one of the options, there's others. Um, one could be that you've already failed another drug or some drug in that class or had some negative reaction to it. Um, but if you meet any one of those, you answer yes to any one of those, then they cannot enforce the fail first. Okay. Also, the step therapy used to give 30 days for the health plans to make a determination. And in all of those states, um, it's gone down to 72 hours and 24 hours in an emergent decision. So at least we have a quicker response mm -hmm. time as well. Thank you. So clearly, we had great speakers. We had good topics. We had good questions. There's no way you can get everything you want to know about these kind of topics covered. And they actually each had 15 minutes. And I think we did a lot in a 15-minute segment there. Um, I told you that this wasn't a to-do, I just hit the wrong button, that um, there wasn't, this wasn't, you're not going to have a to-do, this is not a training per se, but we're looking at next steps in all of our sessions. And I think if we think about, from this one, think about how this resonated with you. Was this a topic, were these topics you were interested in? Is it something you would want to present locally or have advantage to, uh, have access to locally? You know, how can you utilize and share the knowledge that we talked about, the resources Nick talked about? If you are a facilitator, you can consider recruiting guest speakers to these, on these topics to your group. But I think really importantly, don't forget we have the new Live Yes forums on uh, arthritis.org. And here's the good news. We're going to take questions we couldn't get to today and go ahead and answer those on the forums. There's a component of the forum called Ask an Expert, and we will have experts such as, and maybe even, our esteemed speakers today who will be available to answer questions from time to time um, on the forums. Use that. Encourage other people to use it. If you're talking to someone and they have questions and you can't answer it, the forums are always a great place to go. If you haven't gone out and had a demo of the new forums out in the exhibit area, please stop by and do that because they're really kind of fun to watch. So thank you, panelists. Please join me in thanking what I think was a fabulous panel. And I believe we will turn it back over to Lori. All right, well, we're, we're at the downhill 
slide now. There's not too much between me and the evening events. But first, again, I am so grateful, as I'm sure all of you are, for these great fine experts that share their expertise with us in, and in such an enthusiastic way where we had real takeaways. So thank you, thank you again.